a little bit bigger. This is a golden eagle. His name is Scout. He is 18 years old. He is, he is a dear, dear friend of mine. Um, shall we start from the bottom and work our way up, big guy? Look at these feet. Wow. Okay. 600 pounds per square inch of crushing power on those feet. He can drive those talons through my glove and crush the bones of my hand. It's really good. He likes me. We do appreciate that. <laughs> All 7,000 feathers only weigh approximately two pounds in weight, so they're very light. Of course, the bones of birds, their bones are hollow, so his entire skeletal structure, again, only about two pounds in weight. Yet there's a portion of my eagle's body that represents half his total body weight, and that's the, yeah, keep it on the plastic, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> half his body weight, now get comfy. There's my point. Half his body weight is found right here, the pectoral muscles. These large muscles are the motors that he uses to drive that six foot wingspan that allows eagles to fly where hawks and falcons cannot. For eagles have been spotted at altitudes greater than 30,000 feet. And this eagle can comfortably soar in a 40 mile an hour wind, which would ground a hawk or a falcon. And of course, the eyesight of an eagle is legendary. Let me tell you truly how well an eagle can see. Here is an eight pound creature, who weighs eight pounds. An eight pound creature with eyes larger than yours. Not only is his eyes larger, my eagle can see approximately eight times further than you can. But you and I, we get a pair of binoculars. We can see eight times further. Well, not only does he see eight times further, he has six times the number of light sensitive cells, the rods and cones on the back of the eye that we have. So everything he sees is six times clearer. This eagle can spot a jackrabbit five miles away. And he does. For just like the hawk and falcon, all of this comes off, he flies free. He goes thousands of feet in the sky, he flies with the wild eagles. And out north of town, he'll fly the, the ledges north of town, you look up on the cliffs and you see two or three eagles soaring together and you go, I think that's my eagle. But it's a little hard to tell because they're so far away. And you always have to wonder what they're talking about. <laughs> to see my eagle cruising with his friends, I can see my eagle looking over to his buddies and saying, watch this, I have a trained human. <laughs> All I have to do is drift out over that guy's head and he'll run out through the desert with a stick, hitting bushes, flushing out rabbits for me to catch. <laughs> and I will. Now if there are no rabbits to be found, it's time to go home. I can blow my whistle and my eagle will fly back and land on my glove for food. Or I have his toy. I have his leather sack, and I can tie food on his leather sack, I can blow my whistle, throw his toy out of the ground, and my eagle will go into a wonderful dive, headlong, vertical, about 145 miles an hour, and he will kill the leather sack, which is convenient. Eagle questions that I can answer for you. The reason he is called a golden eagle is the same reason for the bald eagle to be bald eagle. The bald because of the white head. The golden eagle has golden feathers on the back of its head. And so that's where he gets the name golden from. Otherwise, he's obviously quite brown. But the golden feathers on his head. Yes? Do you uh, bathe him? Does he bathe himself? Does he yeah, really I, like to do that? Yeah, you, you know those, those, little, those little kiddie pools? Oh, uh, that's his bath pad. Uh, and, and he loves to take a bath. And you know, in the middle of the winter, it could be really cold, break the ice off the, the thing, turn the hose on and fill it up, and he'll jump in when it's ice cold and splash around and have a great time. So he, he, does, he does love the cold. Other questions I can answer for you guys? How much and, and females are quite? Females are about a third larger. So males range from five to nine pounds, and the females range from about nine to about 13 And pounds. their color is basically the same. Color is the same. Yes. Uh, he eats uh, a pound of animal a day. So a pound of jackrabbit, you know, a pound of quail, a pound of rats. Does that make sense? Whole animals. About, about a pound a day. Yes. Uh, does he uh, lose feathers? And if he does, uh, do you collect them up? And well, actually, all birds molt. All birds lose feathers and grow new ones every year. 
and he's no exception to that. And yes, we do put them in a big box. When I get a big box full of feathers, the feathers are shipped to the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's feather lab, where they are distributed to the Native Americans. Basically, we're, e even I am not allowed to wear an eagle feather in my hat. It's, you know, it's very much against the law to do that. Um, I have eagle feathers because I got the whole the whole bird. But yeah, when I get a box full, then I ship them off. Martin, how did you get the scout? Scout, a farmer up in Wyoming was threatening to shoot him. And I was called in by the federal government to go rescue him before he got shot. So this is a full grown wild eagle. Um, it took me a week to set up a bait station where I could bring him in and trap him. So, so he was very much full grown wild when I, when I had to trap him and remove him from the situation. Yes? Same thing, the females are a third larger than the males. Whoa. And so this is a male. But this is a big male. But yes, this oh, is a male. Oh, that's a big male. It's a big male. He's eight pounds, and, and the, about the largest male goes to nine pounds. And the females start at about nine pounds and go to 13 pounds. Oh, slugs. And they mate, do they stay together all the time? Or just the well, they do pair bond for life, but when the nesting season is over, they kind of go their separate directions, they don't really associate with each other, but come uh, about mid-January, they come back to the nesting season and they go through a very, very elaborate courtship to reestablish the bond again. Is that typical of wild birds of prey? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, lifespan? Lifespan, if all goes well, in the wild they will live about 20 years. In captivity, if all goes well, they'll live more than 40 years. He's 18. So we've, we've got another 20 plus years together, he and I. So Martin, yes. how long did it take for you to establish this kind of relationship with him? I mean, you're very friendly. I mean, like, did it take a while? Or? Well, uh, I talk about a little bit in my book. I'm, dis I'm severely dyslexic. Okay? I'm severely dyslexic. Uh, as a child going through school, I remember sitting at a parent-teacher conference and the teacher telling my mother, uh, we've done all we can, Martin will never learn to read, but as long as there's work for ditch diggers, he'll be fine. Okay, they didn't know in the, in the late 50s and early 60s, they didn't know what being dyslexic was. And, and they just, so they didn't have anything that they could help us with. Um, fortunately, I had a very wise grandmother who was a retired school teacher and she saved my life. And we talk about that in my book. But what I discovered as a child, you know, severely dyslexic, short, um, you know, I, I, I wasn't uh, by any means an athlete, and Lord knows you don't want me to sing. You know, I have no talent. And I always wondered why everybody had, you know, something special they could do, and, I, and there's just nothing I could do, that no talent whatsoever. Well, I found my talent. And, and, and being dyslexic is part of it. People who are dyslexic have a slightly higher IQ than normal, and people who are dyslexic have a much higher situational awareness than normal as well, and it's that high situational awareness that, that allows me to work with, with wild animals. Um, I, can, I, can, I can see their moves, I can, I can, I, I'm very much aware of their temperaments and how things are going, and so I, I've been able to work with wild animals that nobody else could touch. And I could take a, a full-grown wild eagle like this one right out of the sky and have you fly free and hunting with me in about a month. I could have a wild eagle sitting in my glove like this uh, in about five, ten minutes. And how long? Uh, sitting on the glove like this in about five or ten minutes. Well, you know what it costs to your face. Of course I do. I, I, I start off this close with a wild eagle because it's, it, is, it is I trust you and I'm, and I'm comfortable with you that, it, that allows the eagle to go, oh, he's not being threatened. Can I have some work with a Patagonian? St. <laughs> <laughs> Joey? I, I, I actually, I, that was my job, was training the wild macaws and, and things at Bush Gardens. Uh -huh. the, the, all the problem birds they would send to me. <laughs> do you also do owls? I, I do all, I do native Utah wildlife, but in the birds of prey, yeah, I do a lot of owls. Absolutely. Any other questions before we call it a night, guys?
Yes. Does he get quills sometimes? You'll see captive uh, birds like parrots, and they pick these quills, and you can go and you can squish them to help. Does uh, do you well? Actually, let me tell you what that is. They're not quills. Or a fly. Yeah, what the quill is is the end of the feather that goes inside the cuticle in, inside the body. That's the quill. The, the what you're seeing there is the protein shaft from the feather's growth. It's called a blood feather. And if you're not careful with that protein shaft, if you if you kind of, you can peel it off if, if the feather's fully grown. But if the feather's not fully grown, what you end up doing is pinching the blood, and you can damage the feather or even break it. The bird can bleed. And and so. You know, you have to be very careful, but yet all birds get that. Do you help with that? For, for the most part, if the bird is healthy, um, you don't have to. You know, some birds in captivity, especially if, if there's genetically not, not a good specimen, they'll, they'll have um, molting problems. But, uh, but no, he's, 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 he's a pest. And the female has one feather that's missing. And yes. it's been that way for the several years that she's been in our yard. Yeah. And let that's me, how we recognize her. Yeah, and let me tell you what happened. Um, if a feather, now with quail and pigeons and prey species birds, the feathers are meant to fall out. And so if a hawk grabs them and they end up with a fistful of feathers, the bird flies away. Does that make sense? With the predatory birds, the feathers are far better adhered into the cuticle, and they're not meant to be pulled out. And so if that hawk got a feather ripped out either by another predator or something else, that if the cuticle is damaged, the feather will never grow back. And, and so it'll be that way for the rest of its life. And why might they guys are down? Sure. Do they have a problem with ravens? There seem to be ravens that bother our hawks in our yard. Ravens bother everybody. <laughs> Yes, they, they, they bother everybody. You know, I, I watched a raven one day, because uh, I have bald eagles up where I live. They come in in the wintertime. And I watched a bald eagle fly, flying along, and a raven was dive bombing it. And the raven would dive, and the ro eagle would turn up, put its feet up, try to grab the raven, and the raven would pitch up. And as soon as the eagle rolled itself back up straight, it would dive again. And it was just, it, you know, just watching this out my front door, I'm going, that poor eagle, that raven is just really a, being, a, being a real problem. And I watched the raven pitch up a little bit higher than normal, and then come down a little bit faster, and the eagle rolled over and went, ground! Rolled back over and flew off with the raven. Oh. <laughs> you only make that mistake once. Oh. Well, thank you guys. Thank Please you. grab a flyer. And if you like the book, you have to play it all the way. But I, I really wanted to answer a question that's been asked, to me, asked about me many, many times. And that is when I'm handling these large, um, dangerous raptors. Why don't I wear gloves? And the truth of the matter is, you know, this is the, this is very much the typical glove that you see us, us using when we're handling birds for falconry. <clears throat> and you'll see in a lot of videos other people using gloves like this just to handle the birds that are that are in rescue. And the problem is, the glove is very very large and clumsy, and it doesn't give me the the touch and the dexterity that I need to handle the birds properly. And, and so I will use the glove in certain situations um, where I have to pull the bird out of a kennel and there's <clears throat> and the bird's uh, confined and there's and, and the bird's facing me and I can't just reach around and grab it. I, I will use a glove initially, but then I take the glove off. And the, probably the best way to describe this is, um, you know, touch is very important and to be able to feel any injuries, breaks, sprains, to be able to feel the bird's keel to see to make sure that it's um, uh, its weight it's just not too thin and and all of that and it's kind of like if you can imagine um, putting on your shoes with a pair of gloves and and it's it's horribly hard to do and you know this is this is a much lighter glove this is just a kind of a standard little work glove 
here that um, that you use for gardening, and this will kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. Um, these are nice and tightly fitted, so they give me the best possible dexterity with a with a pair of gloves that I can use. And it's snowing outside right now. We're very happy about that. And as you can see, um, we're going to put on some shoes and socks so you can kind of see the the effort here that goes into. How this, how awkward this is, and I need the same quality of movement and dexterity with, with my fingers when I'm handling the animals. Yeah, that's it. Can be done. But can you imagine having, not having this kind of sensitivity when you're handling uh, an animal that its life kind of depends on, on your, your ability to feel things? And like I said, this is a far lighter weight kind of glove than uh, the big uh, welding gloves that uh, you see people using when they're handling raptors. And uh, well, I'm going to do it. How about that? There you go. I did it with a pair of gloves. I would much rather not have to put up with that. I would much rather deal with a without having gloves. And I'm certainly not the most coordinated person on the planet, but you can see this is so much easier just to. Uh, work with it. Okay, so that's the reason I handle the birds without gloves because I need the touch, I need the dexterity, I need the movement so that I can handle the birds properly and safely and the gloves are, like I said, there's a reason for using gloves uh, and uh, when we go down and get the eagle, I mean the, uh, the big red-tailed hawk, uh, initially getting out of the chamber, I will use a glove. But for the vast majority of work that I'm doing with these animals, uh, this is a hindrance and not a help. And in falconry, we wear the gloves not for protection as well. In falconry, we wear the gloves because our hands are, are thin and bony and makes a terrible perch. And the birds don't particularly like to sit on our hands. But a nice, thick, leather padded, soft glove gives the birds a, a much, much better grip on our gloves when we're holding them and walking around with them. And so the glove is actually in falconry for the birds' comfort, not for our protection. So, uh, <clears throat> again, please do not try to handle wild animals um, on your own. Uh, they can be dangerous. Um, a talon going through your hand with, with anything any kind of bird of prey, uh, the red-tailed hawk we're going to look at here in a minute, um, any kind of bird of prey, highly infectious. Uh, you, can certainly, you can certainly get a, a variety of bacterial infections that can literally put you in the hospital. So please, if you come across wildlife, do not try to pick them up. If you find a, a wild animal that just seems tame, wild is wild, and the only time a wild animal seems like it's tame is it's sick and and that's when they can be the most dangerous so please if you come across injured wildlife do not try to touch it do not try to pick it up uh, yourselves uh, get on the phone call your local police dispatch your local uh, fish and game or if there's a uh, local wildlife rescue center give them a call and have someone that's highly trained in handling these animals come and do that what we're looking at here is the the red-tailed hawk has had uh, pooped uh, it's defecated, it's, had, it's uh, processed the food that it, that it got last night, so that's a really good sign. Uh, it's still very fluffy, it's still a long way from out of the woods, but now it's really time to put it out into a much bigger chamber where the bird can move around a little bit and get a, a much larger meal, and we'll go from there. Now, 
if he'll sit quiet. Now, if you find a bird like this, please do not try to pick it up because this one is, like I said, it's very sick. Okay, now you see that defensive posturing right there? That's good, we like that. But that basically means that in this kind of a confined space, uh, his fight or flight instinct is kicking in, which means if I reach any closer, he's going to try to attack my hand. And so that's a reason to put on a glove. And so I'll put on my glove right here that you can see, and I'll go ahead and get him. Get the other foot. There we are, pretty boy. Get him on out here. Now, glove comes off because now the glove is of no value to me. I've got it. I've got his feet, as you can see right here. This is my book. This is called Healer of Angels, and uh, I need to get them ready for for a program because when I when I do my wildlife programs I take copies of my book and we sell them as a fundraiser uh, for our wildlife rescue center and so it helps us raise money to feed the animals so if you ever like uh, animal stories this is 40 years of wildlife rescue stories and the wisdom of grandparents and I my wife and I we autograph each and every one of them but what's even more important than me autographing the books is that um, you get my eagle's autograph as well. This is here, this is a rubber stamp of my eagle. His name is Scout, this is his footprint. And what we did is we took the, uh, put a little food cutter color on the bottom of his foot, let him walk around on a, on a big piece of paper, chose the very, very best footprint from that, and we had a rubber stamp made of it. We stamp each and every book with Scout's footprint when you buy them directly through our Wildlife Rescue Center. And so that's, what it looks like, that is, that's Scout's footprint. And then I autograph the book and my wife autographs the book. If you, if you buy the book directly through our Wildlife Rescue Center website, um, all of the profits from the sale of the book go to or help feed sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife. And, and that's the only way that you get the autographed copy. So, so that's kind of an incentive for people to, uh, to help us and, and buy the book. And, you know, and there's a lot of fun stories in the book. There's, there's stories in the book about the first elephant I trained. There's stories in the book about um, working with big cats. There's stories in the book about vulture vomit. And, and so it's, it's really, it's, it's a very fun read and for the family. And, and the prophets, like I said, really help us feed the sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife that we care for. As always, uh, every little bit of support helps. So please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, to our uh, YouTube channel and uh, help spread the word about the Southwest Wildlife Foundation and, and the good work that we do here.